Yes, it's all things woo tonight as we continue on with the UFO report. John Hudson has us all set up. John, it's always good to have you here, my friend. Always good to be here. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. I do appreciate it after getting your head full of Keith tonight. So, Right. All right, we're going to kick things off. Christopher Sharp, blogger, journalist. Who is he? And tell us about the article he wrote. Well, in, in full disclosure, he is, uh, I don't believe he's, I don't know if he's the only, well, I assume he is the only one. He's actually the editor of of the Liberation Times. So he doesn't normally do any writing for them. Um, but um, but he's been wanting to. And so this is this is kind of a, a big step out for him. And, um, and it's just, it's just a fantastic read. He just, he does a, it's, you know, it's, it's long, but it needed to be. And it, it just, he does a great job. Basically what he did is he did exactly what I would have done if, if I had a longer, you know, longer time on this show. He basically just went through John Ramirez's entire presentation and just called out each part that he thought was important and, and, and critical. And so it's, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's probably something everyone should have next to them while they're looking at the slides. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's a good one. It's, it's a good thing. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to call out two things that, that are essentially about the presentation, but are also called out in, in Christopher's article. And that is that when, when I mentioned the other day that, um, that Mr. Ramirez had, had made a comment about the fact that uh, the word um, hybrid was not, you know, not in the schedule yet. Uh, he actually went on further to say that what we are witnessing is not disclosure, but scheduled dissemination. And I, I think that's a very important distinguishing characteristic to notice. And I think that if you look at what's going on and view it as scheduled dissemination, um, and, and he went on to say, meaning that things need to be set up before other things can be revealed, essentially. Um, and, and this is what he said in the interview. I, I think that paints a very, very clear picture of, of, of what's, what's going on on the, on the government side of things. Um, and and I, I'd be curious to see what you think of such a thing, Dave. <laughs> I really don't know. You kind of blew my mind the other night talking about John Ramirez. And you and I had had a private conversation about that. And, you know, I mean, just the fact that he's really deep into the technology and uh, what we're saying that we're not witnessing any sort of disclosure. I've always said it's, it seems more of a confirmation, you know, and very up to date on what these narratives are. I mean, I want to find out more about this guy. I want to try and get him on this show. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we we need to, we need to, and 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 he's uh, and he, he like I said, I I've been I've been talking to him, you know, off and on for a couple months now um, on this sideline chat, um, and uh, and you know, honestly, when he first came into our when he first came into our little group, a lot of us were very skeptical of him, very skeptical of him, and it's taken some him some time to prove himself to all of us. But the other two things I want to call out before we move on is one is that on Reddit, um, someone reported today. Um, that um, that someone on, I believe on Reddit that is at a significant level in the DoD was able to actually confirm John Ramirez's career background, um, which I wasn't at all worried about. Um, I believe from the comment that Bob McGuire made that uh, Bob McGuire has actually heard of him uh, and, is, and is aware of his work. Um, and I know that at some point um, John Ramirez actually interacted with Semivan. Um, uh, while, you know, while inside. And, um, and so, you know, there's a lot of people that should be able to confirm his identity, but his identity has at least been confirmed by one person as far as what his career was and what he did. And then the last thing I want to bring up, which I should have brought up the other day, and I apologize to everyone, because this to me is a significant thing. And that was because it caught me off guard when he said it. He said that he feels that the James Webb telescope might be a breaking point for all of this. And what he what he means by that is that he believes that there's a chance he doesn't know this for sure. This is just his hypothesis that there might be uh, things in space that uh, the James Webb telescope will be directed at intentionally um, as a way of essentially drawing attention to something that's coming or something that's happening. That the James Webb telescope might be that 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 dam that breaks that 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 really releases a lot of information. Does John that, that surprised have, me. Does John Ramirez have that much knowledge and power? Well, he he retired in tw 2009. 
Um, and so, and so, and so one of the things that he makes very clear in his presentation, which I, I absolutely adored about him was, was, you know, he makes very clear what he's, what he says he knows and what he's, his, his, you know, his guesses are his, his hypothesis. And that falls completely under his hypothesis. That's not based on any specific knowledge about the James Webb. That's just based on his 25 years on the inside, knowing how things work and saying, you know, that, that that sounds to me like a, a tipping point. Very interesting. Well, John, we're going to use your connection, try and get him on the show. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely we, need to, we need to do that. That that just yep. sounds way too important not to have him come in and describe what he knows. Now, is he blocked by any NDAs? Uh, I assume that he is. Um, and, and obviously, um, uh, you know, one of the things that he announced in this presentation was that he was actually read out of 27 different programs. Um, so this guy wasn't just a nobody. This guy was in the science directorate. He was in some very significant places. And, um, and so, but he, is, he was completely read out many, many years ago. Um, but needless to say, a bunch of the stuff you sign is lifetime. And, um, and, and the thing is, is that the other thing I, I really like about him is that he sent this presentation to CIA before he showed it to anybody. And every time he makes a change to it, he sends it back to CIA to get it approved. And one of the things that he's trying to do, and you should see the grin on his face when he talks about this, is he's trying to get stuff redacted. He's trying to see how far he can push before they start redacting stuff. And there's been several slides where he was amazed that they didn't get redacted. All right, let's move on here to the second part of tonight. Douglas Dean Johnson, who is he and why is he important? So, you know, actually, Dave, you might be able to inform me better on that than, than I can inform from the audience in that essentially how what, how, what I know of him is, um, is he seems like a, a very professional researcher that I've interacted with a few times on Twitter. And whenever he's written anything, it's been very well written. It's been very clean and it's been very easy to read. And he seems to have a good handle on what's going in the government. But beyond that, um, honestly, I don't know very much about him myself. Well, I do know that he is very followed on UFO Twitter. He seems to be right at the forefront of a lot of interesting news, especially on the congressional front yes. and on the you know governmental side of things. I, th I think this guy has really you know done his homework. He is somebody yes. who's very interesting, especially when it comes to following the entire UAP phenomena. With, He's very thorough. Yes, very thorough. Yes, without a doubt. Yes. And so basically, um, you know, he was the one that brought a lot of our attention to to this um, amendment. And so it's, it's Amendment SA um, uh, 4281. It's by uh, um, uh, um, uh, Senator Gillibrand. Uh, Gillibrand. Um, if I'm mispronouncing your name, ma'am, I, I apologize. And um, and so she, um, you know, she's kind of um, I mean, she's well known, but she's, to my knowledge, a newcomer to this whole UAP thing. And um, and what uh, Johnson's article does a really good job of covering is not just her amendment, but all you know the other amendments that have come before it, and what the progression has been. And you know, if you guys were paying attention before the 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 Senate the Senate uh, wording was wasn't very good. It was basically just what what we had before with the House course. It was the House wording that was strong before. It was very strong. It was very good, and it appears that what she did and and, and remember she's in the Senate. She took the House wording and started with that, and then made it even stronger. And, you know, if if I can just if I can just, you know, uh, try to read some of this really quick, just because I, I think it's very Do pertinent um, is is it essentially what what her amendment is would would create is an anomaly surveillance and resolution office and a basically ASRO. There would be a UAP focused office that would be placed in the appropriate component of the Department of Defense with a joint organization of the Department of Defense and the Office of the Directorate of National Intelligence. The head of ASRO would be charged with developing procedures to synchronize and standardize the collection, reporting, and analysis of incidents, including adverse um, um, uh, philosophical, no, 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 um, physiological uh, effects re uh, regarding uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon across the Department of Intelligence communities. In doing so, the ASRO head 
could be uh, uh, could propose as appropriate the use of any resource, capability, asset, or process of the department and the intelligence community. This is a very strong role that she's creating. And I, I have the bill attached to this, and it goes on. She goes into a ton of detail, including creating a, a, a science advisory board, um, a, a kind of a separate sub-organization to do research. Um, and I mean, she goes into exquisite detail. It's 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 a long amendment. I mean, it's a very long amendment. Um, and I mean, this is this is good stuff. I mean, and the the problem is, and 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 uh, you know, Johnson talks about in his article is that you know we don't know how all the negotiations are going to go, right? And and essentially, all of these amendments have to be voted on. Now, she's a pretty well known character. She's got a lot of good friends in, in the Senate. You know, if she can turn some of them onto it. You know, it might get some support. She hasn't made any public announcements about it. So, you know, we don't really know how strongly she feels about it. But without a doubt, this is my favorite wording that I've seen so far. This is this is this is really this is really good stuff. I mean, this is this is really good stuff. I don't know where the budget would come from. I don't know, you know, um, you know, how would like what a lot of people don't realize is when Space Force was created. One of the reasons why Space Force was created so quickly is because there was already a Space Force in each of the branches. Like each branch had their own Space Force. And so all they did was essentially grab all those people and ship them all together into a new org. So, yeah, they're hiring and they're building and so forth. But the, they, they kind of were like ready to go with a you know microwave oven kind of meal. Right. Um, and um, and so it's unclear as to exactly how this would how this would roll out. But um, but it's um, it's 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 very, very impressive. And like I said, what I really like about his article is the fact that he doesn't just talk about her amendment. He talks about, you know, what, you know, what happened before, what the previous amendments look like, you know, what was driving them, you know, and, and it kind of shows a, a story arc of sorts that shows us how we got to where we are today. Very interesting. All right. Now, now one of the things that you brought up here as well, I got to bring it up here is this essay four, two, eight, one. But that that is the amendment. Okay, so sorry, be, I'm having a Canadian moment here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, not knowing. So with this amendment that you were just talking about, right? How deep do you see this going? Because this is kind of a first that we're hearing about this. Well, that that's what's so interesting is it is it she didn't just so first off what I was hoping from the beginning was that the the Senate would adopt the House language because the House language was significantly stronger, right? The Senate, all they did was carbon copy what was already there. They just left the task force a task force. They didn't really do anything with it. They just left it exactly how it was before. It was the House that built out this huge idea of, of eliminating the task force, creating an official office, you know, doing all this stuff. And she basically took that and then expanded it by significant amounts. And so essentially, I mean, she goes into... Um, you know, I mean, it's amazing. Um, it's incredibly small font. So, you know, have, have fun, you know, have fun um, um, reading it, folks. But I mean, she goes into, you know, uh, you know, defining, you know, essentially, um, you know, who gets access to it, what security levels they have to be at, um, you know, uh, you know, what to like, you know, two people must be appointed from the Presidential National Academy of Sciences. Two people must be appointed from the National Academy of Engineering. One person must be appointed by the President's National Academy of Medicine. I mean, she goes into extreme detail as to I mean, she builds it out. I mean, it, it's it's this looks like something that was architected in a way that it's designed to be executed on on the go. It's not something where you would have to take it and develop it into something. This looks like something that is really kind of like a ready-made, a pre-baked solution that you could really do some, do some, you could, you know, kind of be on the ground running. So I don't know who's, who, who help she got from, but, um, and, and I don't know what her angle is, you know, um, you know, she's not my senator, so I don't know a whole lot about her. I've, I've certainly heard her name several times before, you know, there aren't that many senators, so, you know, you, they kind of stick out, um, you know, but, um, you know, and it's interesting that she's um, I mean, just not to get into politics, but I find it interesting. She's a Democrat. Um, you know, I think once again, this speaks to the to the bipartisan interest in this topic, but she clearly takes it very seriously. All right, buddy. Thank you so much for another wonderful edition of the Unbiased UFO Report.